Hello everyone. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Doctor Who and Autism series. Uh, today I'm from Aaron, and it's going to be awesome. We're talking about Doctor Who and autism today. So, Aaron, thank you for for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be cool because like your first time doing anything like this, so it's going to be a good experience yeah. for you. First time Zoom, first time podcast, pretty much first time everything <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah. So. Before we start talking about any of that, would you mind just introducing yourself for a little bit? Yeah, um, well, I'm Erin, as you've said. Um, um, I, well, we, we, we kind of found each other kind of on TikTok. I do yeah. like little Doctor Who videos on TikTok. It's actually been quite nice. This is Spyro. She's going to be getting in the road a lot. Um, <laughs> and I... Pretty, pretty much yeah I saw like your you did a wee video on your podcast and I was just like oh my god I just got diagnosed and then that's kind of how we like ended up here pretty much we'll blame TikTok it's TikTok's fault how, <laughs> that started all this yeah yeah it's about TikTok <laughs> yeah TikTok's fault uh, yeah because I think it um I think it was the trailer for the series I think yes uh, yeah yeah because um, like Doctor Who was one of the things that when I actually I got my diagnosis in May that I was kind of just like, well, that makes sense. That's why I was so like, yeah. Well, I don't I don't know if obsessed is the right word, but I was very much very yeah. into Doctor Who. Yeah. <laughs> and it was kind of like, well, that makes sense. That's why. Yeah, that's why we talk about it so much. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's why I never <laughs> shut up about it. Yeah. Like, like, and when I was in primary two, I told people, I was so excited. I told people that aliens were going to crash into Big Ben. Like, whenever the coming next time for Aliens of London happened, I was telling everyone in my class, no one cared, but I was telling them anyway. Yeah, like, I was the same, you know, like, you find many people in school, like primary school, like that, like Doctor Who too. Yeah. Like, like people, I, I was actually kind of like, I got very much the, isn't it for boys? And I was just like, no. <laughs> no, wow. never. It was never for both. Oh, I don't know about when it was the classic era, but I know now. I, no, never. No, like it's it's for anyone. It's like like anything. Like like people can say that about James Bond because uh, yeah. yeah, like every program is like for whoever wants to watch it. I guess. Mm hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And like it never even dawned on me as a boyish thing because there were things that I used to think, oh well, that's for boys when I was little. But like, even when I was little, Doctor Who always seemed like a very for everyone kind of thing, you know? Yeah, like my brother told me about it, like um when Crystal Augustine was um like it's gonna start again, and like I watched it and I was like. Oh. I was five, I think, at the time, five, five or six. Uh, so, um, especially, I like it was quite scary back then as well. Like episodes. Um, yeah. Um, that's one of the things I liked about it actually, because it was it was scary, and you you either get frightened, you watch it at night. Um, yeah, and it was like a family program, but they weren't afraid to kind of be a bit scary or have some serious topics going on there. Although I was very, when my sister was young, she was afraid of the Daleks. She was like terrified of them. I remember there was a St. Patrick's parade. This was even before the reboot, because like, like there was like Palm Baker and everything on it. Whereas if the reboot had, had happened, it would have been like David Tanner and stuff. But there was a Dalek on it, and my sister was terrified. And I used to laugh at her and think it was hilarious. And then my time came when the Weeping Angels happened, because I used to think, oh, I'm really brave. I can watch Doctor Who and not be scared. And then Blink happened and I was traumatized for like a year and a half. Yeah, Blink was just scary. It was. Yeah. Like that was the first time like I actually felt like and like because people always said, Oh, I hid behind the sofa and stuff. I was sobbing <laughs> at the end of Blink. Like I was terrified. Like I'm over it now. Like I can watch the episode now and, and I can appreciate it for what it is, that it was a very good episode, very well written very spooky especially for a doctor light episode you know yeah. what i mean like because the doctor light episodes beforehand it was love and monsters and i don't get the hate for love and monsters i enjoy love and monsters for what it is and the absorbable off was designed by a child so i don't think people give enough credit to that 
yeah. I think they did well with what they were working with. Yeah, the, the I like the only thing about the Love and Monsters episode which confused me is um it, it kind of comes to common sense. I I I, I think the episode was good. Um but mm -hmm. but you know when they people started going missing, like you, you'd have like, it was coming from a pattern, like each day, like like the like the guy um who played the uh, um Zorbalov, um he was asking people to stay behind, like a person each time. And he said that that, that Angela girl was like she had to go to doctors. And like you would think that they she she would normally she would say something, she would contact you. Um I think that that's the point of the episode what was like well, it baffled me because like it comes to common sense where you would kind of think, hang on, people yeah. are missing, what's going on? And they were always seeing him. Like he's yeah. the he's the one. Like, yeah. like well, me and my sister, we both we both we've had eczema all our lives. So when he said, No, no, don't touch me, I have eczema, we were like, That's not how eczema works, bro. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> something's wrong here. <laughs> like, like we were immediately like clocking on. Yeah, but that was a. I guess that could be a scary episode in a way, like absorbing people. Yeah, and Ursula's fate. What they should have just let Ursula go. Yeah, like, he shouldn't have done what he did. I would not want to be a face on a pavement stone. Maybe I would rather. I. I would rather have been left alone. <laughs> and like they're like, oh yeah, we've got somewhat of a love life. You're like, what do you mean? You keep her on your computer desk. <laughs> That was, that's the part that kind of got me. Like, that's where I was kind of like, okay, that's a bit <laughs> weird. Yeah, it is weird. Like, you got to let him move on. Like, he can't just be with concrete for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's going to get to the point where he's going to meet someone else and he's going to start leaving her, like, just sitting in his, like, on his desk. <laughs> he's going to meet somebody he can actually go on dates with and take outside and stuff. It just, it just seemed like a rather weird choice to make. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't doesn't often make a lot of sense. Well, not none of that episode really did, really. Mm, yeah. Um, but it was not a bad episode. It can't in the middle. Yeah, like apparently, Love and Monsters and Fear Her, they're both seen as kind of like bad episodes, and I'm just sort of like, I thought they were all right. Like I don't have like strong feelings for them. Like I'm not gonna like defend it with my life or anything. But yeah, was I just um... thought it was okay. Was Fear Her the one where she was doing all the drawings of, of the people and they were missing? Yeah. Yeah. That I didn't think that was that bad. No, not at all. Like, I never really, like I, like I say, I just thought it was like an okay episode. It was good. The thing that stresses me out more is that it was based in the future of 2012. And that was now a decade ago. <laughs> like, <laughs> the future episodes are now in the past. Oh yeah, like did you do you remember the the um the the Silurian one, um where at, at the start of the episode um it was set in twenty ten I think, like yeah. it, it might be twenty twenty actually. It might have been. I think it was twenty twenty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was twenty twenty, and then of course twenty twenty was two years ago. Yeah, <laughs> uh. it's like like watching like in the classic era, like the first Doctor and the second Doctor. I think there's like a second Doctor story where like they go to like twenty. 20 or something like that and like they're imagining like hover cars and stuff like that I think it was the enemy of the world the episode's called but I was just like no <laughs> still no hover cars or would anything be nice. it, yeah it would be like the, the like I suppose it's the same as back, with back to the future too it was set in 2015 like and they had like their, they had like they had everything like the hover skateboards and everything and just yeah. like we're not even close. <laughs> I think I think the past episodes are the best. I yeah. In the past. Yeah, like I like it when like they meet like somebody like a uh, some sort of like historical figure, like when it was Shakespeare or Agatha Christie or mm. like Agatha Christie. I didn't realize that she actually did go missing. I thought that was something Doctor Who made up. Oh, is it... oh, she 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 went missing. Yeah, she actually did go, like, well, I'm saying this now, I'm not even 100% sure now that I'm saying it, <laughs> but, it, like, the historical episodes actually taught me stuff, like, I always remembered when World War One started, 
because of human nature and the family of blood because they kept going oh you know what happens next yeah. year like you're preparing them all for war and stuff and and I used to be able to like say it in school and stuff and they'd be like where'd you learn that and I'd just be like Dr. Hey <laughs> yeah like you've got I've had people on here who like teachers and that they, they, they show a, a video from Dr. Who in, in the history lessons <laughs> yeah and, and stuff like that, which it, it, it's good because, like, you do learn stuff from do- watching the show, and, like, history and stuff. Yeah. Like, it, it, you just, and, like, you don't even realise you're learning either. Like, it's not like one of those things where you're just sitting going, oh. Yeah. Like, you're enjoying it. Like, you're enjoying learning it. It'd be more fun learning that way because it, it's almost like you're not learning. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. If they had been playing Doctor Who in history classes, I would have done history GCSE. Like, yeah. if that was how they were teaching them, I would have done it. Like, I would have passed with flying colours. <laughs> yeah, like, that, it'd, be, it'd be so much easier. Um, yeah. Um, well, for the ones that who are interested, I guess. Well, yeah. Like, I, I don't know if it would have worked as much in my kind of class or year, because they weren't really, they weren't as into it. I remember my principal once, I can't remember what he was talking about, but during assembly, like, he just started talking about Doctor Who. Like, he was just like, oh, there's this character, the doctor, and he tries to help people no matter what. And I remember everyone just looking at me. They just turned to look at me like, oh, that's the thing you <laughs> you like. And I was just like, why did the principal have to do this to me? Well, you know, you don't remember whenever you get told that you don't do a, pre- a, like, a presentation on something that you're interested in. I always do it about Doctor Who because it's easiest. Yeah. Like, I remember doing yeah. a, pre- a presentation saying about David Tennant, um, like what he does who he is and what he's done before what he does now like so yeah. you know that that, that that kind of stuff is simple we get asked mm. and stuff like that there was actually a point in my life where I was I, I think this was actually part of my masking behavior but I didn't realize it at the time um everyone was always like talking about how like David Tennant was like attractive and stuff like that so because I didn't really like I wasn't into boys I'm gay I didn't know it at the time yeah. I started kind of like thing like yeah totally and I kind of my way of expressing that is looking into everything like at one point I knew everything there was to know about David Tannen anything he'd been in it, it, when he married Georgia his kids everything and then thankfully I kind of <laughs> backpedaled out of it a little bit like I can't really I haven't retained a lot of it but there was a point in time where you would have been able to be like just like tell me like something about him, and I would have been able to write an essay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it, I suppose it, it comes back to like what we said before, like about like um like hyper fixations, and like you you can't stop talking about something. And and, yeah. and Doctor Who, for example, it's it, for, not everyone's the same. Like but like you know you find I found quite a lot of people in the autistic community have autism, and they like Doctor Who, so. Yeah, yeah, I think the doctor is a very good car is a very easy character for people with autism to relate to. Yeah, yeah, because it kind of shows that kind of traits like the doctor does. Um, yeah, and it kind of makes you feel seen and kind of be like, oh, I get that, I understand, I kind of relate to that, and like it makes you feel kind of like, well, you're seeing it. I always think visibility and being able to see it is very important. It always has been very important. Um. And being able to see and relate to like his behaviors and the way that it kind of even like even before I knew because like I said I only got diagnosed in May this year, yeah. but even then, being able to see it makes you feel validated and you kind of understand and feel more kind of normal in your own kind of when you when you kind of express those kind of traits as well. Yeah, yeah, like it's still like lo- lots has to be done like like with autism though because. Like, like, like not everyone knows what it is and like um yeah. it's done a lot better now that than it was possibly in the 80s where you, mm-hmm. you, you you wouldn't know um like, like it, it's much different back then but but you know like like, like like people just it is good like you do stuff like this and you talk about it and like you get diagnosed because getting diagnosed for anything is hard yeah it's not easy I did an article when I first got my diagnosis about like about how it's worthwhile to kind of like go for a diagnosis even when you're an adult because I got a lot of questions like you're out of school why 
bother now. And I kind of did an article once I was diagnosed for my my local kind of Belfast Live, just saying about the importance of like, you know, going for it, even if you are an adult. And a lot of the people in the comments, they were saying about the waiting list. And that was their biggest, like, biggest thing that would put them off. And I think that's a big problem in like many facets of the healthcare system in general. But the way I saw it was just kind of like, because I was told it's two years whenever I first went to the doctor and like, because I had to sign a write a form and everything kind of describe why I felt this way and stuff like that. And they said, you know, it's two years. But the way I saw it was like, I'm going to be doing the same stuff that I would be doing, but I would just be doing it while on a waiting list. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think like, like, like you can, like people go on the way to this and I think like people can pay to go private, I think, aren't they? um yeah. to get that diagnosis i think that's what happened to me because I, I i got diagnosed when i was nine um yeah. and i'm 20 now so it's a while ago but um i i didn't remember awfully a lot i remember going to london and having tests and stuff um mm-hmm. but it's not like um like i think a lot of people who don't know what it is or they make assumptions like people think it's like a disease when it's not like it's not something that you can pass or even if even diseases not everything can be passed yeah Um, uh, but but yeah like like earlier this year I saw like a tweet like someone put like like an organization actually and that's saying how much like people need to be cured of autism and stuff like that so that that's why not everyone understands because you've got people putting false like information out there when when it's not correct yeah, like I in the article I did, now that you say that, it reminded me there was someone, because obviously the interviewer for the article asked me things like, what are you doing? Like, do you have a job and stuff like that? And I mentioned that I wrote a book and you can buy it on Amazon. There was someone in the comments of that article and they were just like, she wrote a book. Why does it matter to get a diagnosis? And it was just like, people with autism can do stuff, you know? Like, do, like just because I published a book, it doesn't make it any less important or relevant because there there are many people throughout history who have been able to achieve great things and that the, and being autistic doesn't take away from that and it was really baffling like there was other people trying to like educate the person in the comments but they, they would they seemed to be one of those people who were just like not they weren't like up for a discussion or anything like that where I might which is mindset I don't understand but you know I, that's just the way some people are but I think actually being in being autistic, because I know the traits are different for girls and boys, it actually yeah. helped my creative side because it because creativity is one of the things that is very common in girls alongside masking and things like that. That's why it's more likely for girls to be diagnosed in adulthood because they kind of mask and act like everyone else and try to mimic the behaviors of the people around them, which is also why I think it's important to kind of go for it in adulthood. Yeah, yeah, like because back when I was younger, um, when I got diagnosed, um, like not like you, you'd get quite a lot of people getting diagnosed, like well my age, but now like in in twenty twenty two, um, that you get more people in adulthood, you know, like yeah, uh, getting diagnosed, not not just in your twenties, some some people later on in life, um. And yeah, like it's not like an age thing, like, and it is like, like you say, it's different for girls and boys, like, um, like, like, like there's barriers there, and and and, and there's things that not everyone's gonna be like, um, wanting to share, like, like, it's it's hard, it, it, when you're diagnosed with anything, it is hard, you know, like speak about it straight away. Um, yeah. Yeah, like when I was growing up, I didn't accept have an autism because I thought it was bad um because mm-hmm. when I was in school I didn't really understand certain things like why have I got autism and I, I, I moved from mainstream um to a special school um where uh, people have autism and not just autism all, all different things as well um and yeah like it's it is um it's interesting you know just to see what other people how they go about it yeah I was very fortunate because I have family members who have autism so like all my life it's just always kind of like I've been able to experience it 
firsthand and kind of know that like it it's not a hindrance like the the the, the people in my family who have it they've gone on and they've, they've done amazing things and they're they're just they're like and it sounds ridiculous saying it but it, they're the same as everyone else in the same way you or I is the same as everyone else and I think that's something that people don't really understand as much because like it, it doesn't mean like like we're gonna be like it just means we our brains work a bit differently you know yeah it's not it's not a bad thing like it's it's good because we don't want all our brains to work the same um, yeah it'd be very boring that way if everyone was the same yeah like we wouldn't need to be talking now i don't know what you're gonna say you know what i was gonna say <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't even be a conversation to be had because I go to like, like, oh, we might as well know that's a podcast gone by. Yeah, but like, I oh, know that. Oh, you know that. Yeah, <laughs> um, I knew you were gonna yeah. say that. Yeah, yeah, but with with like work and stuff, it is quite. There's a stigma around autistic people when get jobs because it is quite hard. You know, it, it's it's hard to get jobs anyway. You know, um, but it's just it's it's been like accepted, I guess, in, in a workplace where where people are just don't understand and if they want it like understand um and and, and kind of how their presence is i guess like like maybe your boss or like how they are with you or and stuff like that because it, it is tough to even find work you know especially after yeah. covid because like well not after covid we're still in covid um mm-hmm. but it, it's very hard yeah like jobs in general are just like even bef- before you even add the being autistic, like jobs are like ridiculous. Like it would be like, oh, you need like, what is it like three to four years experience? Bef- mm. But like, we're not like, and then you try to find experience somewhere and they'd be like, no, to do the experience, you need experience or something like that. And you're like, what is even happening? Like, I like, <laughs> like my brain, like, <laughs> like I can't like comprehend how, like how they even get people to even work for them, you know? With with that, those being the requirements. Yeah, and like if you're doing something, like a job maybe that requires, um, it, it requires you to do something for a amount a certain amount of time, and you're not allowed to stop. Um, and if you say I'm just gonna I'm gonna have a break now, um, I need a few minutes, and they might say, uh, well, you're not careful to do this job if if you if you can't do it in a certain amount of time, and like. Mm-hmm. It's like it's, pressure is like it's really hard, you know. Like if you have pressure on certain things, because you you don't want to be boss. You want to enjoy your job. You want yeah. to you want something that you enjoy. Um, not everyone is fortunate to have that, but if you do, it's it's nice. It, it's it's always nice. It, it doesn't really feel like a job, I guess, if you you do something that you enjoy. Yeah. I I the only proper like besides writing my book, I just I did voluntary work for. I'm not sure if I should name it. I don't know how that works, but I did voluntary work, basically like retail in a shop. And like the people who were nice, they made it worth it. But the people who weren't, <laughs> it was kind of like, why am I here? <laughs> like, why am I doing this? <laughs> You're kind of like, I'm not even being paid to be here. Can't you? It's like just, <laughs> and it's a charity shop too. It's actually ridiculous. Like, you, like retail work for like, an ordinary shop I don't know if it's like better or worse but knowing that you're doing it for a charity and people yeah. are coming in and, do, and doing what they're doing you're just kind of like this is like it's wild yeah that's, that's pretty crazy Cause, yeah yeah because it is um it's interesting like because like not everyone um speaks about these things like like I guess you don't have to speak to someone that you don't know that because that with the stick of autism not not everyone's friendly like yeah. um about it like like people think um it, it like people are very smart people are not like it, it's why you get kind of like, i guess you get different levels don't you like each person is yeah. different um like you 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 may be good at writing but i may not be <laughs> yeah <laughs> um um i do like quite like writing but you know, I, I'm the type of person that cannot read a book. Like, it, 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 well, I can read. I'm good at reading. Yeah. Um, but in a sense where I get bored easily. So, so you know, in school, uh, primary school, or, or, or for example, in class reading a book. And I, I always hated it when a teacher would kind of, you know, it would pick, they would pick on someone that they think is an, um, 
paying attention or, or something, or maybe just daydreaming like me. <laughs> um, and it's like, what part are we on now? What uh, can, can you read the next pit, part? Um, where and then I, I, I was like, what, what page? Um, and when the teacher was reading it, like, and I find it hard to follow because I get bored. I, I always think, what, what am I going to do after school? Um, am I going to go on the PlayStation later? Am I going to, what game am I going to play? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, that kind of stuff. And like, I guess that's part of my autism because I can get easily distracted. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the thing I didn't like about like school in a way because you know, if you're trying to concentrate, but then someone speaks to you, and then you're not going to ignore them if they're if they're being maybe disrupted or not. Like you can't concentrate if someone's talking to you. So yeah. you've got to reply to them. And then a teacher sees you talking to them, and probably talking to the person that's maybe maybe more well behaved, maybe. Yeah. Um, and they'll say, "Why are you talking to them? Like you're supposed to be doing your work." And then. I guess you feel bad for doing that, but you shouldn't really because you haven't really done much wrong. Yeah, you were just doing like what you think, like the like someone's talking to me. I have to, I speak back. Like it, it, it seems like you know common sense. Someone talks to me, I speak back. Not like someone's talking to me, but I need to focus the yeah. television or something. Yeah, I always thought it was good when, like. Right, I get when you you know in classes, so everyone's got to be quiet for thirty minutes, which never happens. There's no point doing it, really, is there? Because <laughs> no one's gonna be quiet. Like, it, yeah, really. I think it's better when you're talking because you're multitask. Well, not everyone can multitask, but it is quite. If if you're right about something, you're like, I I'm sure we what like you do a piece right about Doctor Who, um, at school, like. That you get after write your own story about about something that you like and write, write, write about Doctor Who and then you could possibly make things up about it. Uh, to, like integrate so many like Doctor I call them like Doctor Who isms into like what I was writing like very much like speech patterns and kind of a, a bit of the drama like I used to like put into like my essays. I think I stole the line. I stole a line from Midnight. I think it was about like I, I think the doctor said it stopped. Why is it stopped? And I put that into an essay and made it like really dramatic and stuff. And I think it was just supposed to be like write a story and I wrote like a whole bloody like saga so, using like inspiration from Doctor Who. So whoism. <laughs> whoism, yes, the Doctor yeah. Who -ism. Yeah. That's a new word. <laughs> Yeah, like it's not necessarily like I didn't necessarily write like the doctor into my story, but I wrote like a kind of like something that's like very common in kind of Doctor Who yeah. sort of whoism. Yeah, you, you take things out of certain episodes. Like Midnight was a really well written episode. Because, um, mm -hmm. like, still to this day, you kind of think, who was that? Who's knocking on the door? <laughs> I think it was a very good, like, kind of kind of what is a what's the word like a kind of study on human behavior as well like how people act when they're put under such like pressure and you kind of see like the worst of well i don't know if they were humans were they humans i don't know because i was gonna say see the worst of humanity but i suppose to see the worst in people when they're put under a pressure like that it's it's maybe some sort of substance that was integrated into their body maybe um, well, when it was getting transferred in the play, um, it was maybe something like that that happened because, or, or some sort of illness even, or bug that you can catch where you just you're not in your body, really. Yeah. Uh, someone's taken over, you just copy whatever someone else is doing. Yeah, and then it passes along and kind of develops itself, and whoever has it can move and. Yeah. God, it is kind of really, and then when you don't really know what it, what it was, like it it can run. We know it can run because the guy said that it was running towards them, which really made me uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah the thing is, I didn't see anything when, when they were saying that. Like, is it just yeah. integrated on one person who was the target, maybe? Oh, the amount of times I've paused the TV though to try to see if they like if they'd put something like like because he said it looked like a shadow, like maybe I missed something, so I was like pausing it and kind of like looking with really close to is it there did they put it in yeah i don't know if that episode was after or before the bachelor's narada episodes i think it was after because oh, okay. i think 
it was a it was it was because it was light it was a Donna light episode because Donna Catherine Tate had the film turn left. Uh, oh yeah, it was wasn't it? It was the episode after, so maybe it could have been something to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, turn left was a good episode. I liked it because like it's basically a story of Donna. Um, yeah. That was good. And basically, like what would happen, like. And like it was interesting seeing like everything that we had been watching up until this point, what would have happened if it hadn't been stopped? Like the Titanic crashing into Buckingham Palace, um, the hospital and everything that was just happening, like if it hadn't been stopped, this yeah. is what would have happened. I remember I had a I had a toy time beetle. It came in Doctor Who Adventures. It was just this wee hollow thing, but my mum hated it because it was a big beetle, and I used to like leave it about like on the sofa and stuff, and on her bed and stuff, just, <laughs> just, just, be just because I was because <laughs> I, I thought it was funny that she was scared of it so much. I I loved the Doctor Who Adventures. Oh, it, was it was great. It it was the best. Like, do, is it still going? The, like, I, I think the last ones I got was under Matt Smith, but I did go to uh, like a little shop and I collect. There was a load of uh, Capaldi ones. Um, I don't think it was the ones that that were like. I think it might have been a bit different. They were just comic magazines, but I don't know if they still do them. If they, I would love them to bring them back for like under Shooty Gatwa. Yeah, because yeah, because I like I used to. I had so many. Like I had a shoebox full of like the bits and pieces you get from it, like the the slithering slime and stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah. The, there was like a I think I got a psychic paper from it as well. Yeah. And the what's the word? There was a silent notebook, so I must have got some of the Matt Smith ones. There was a notebook yeah. with the silence on it, and I had lost the key to it, so I had to like try and like because that one of those terrible locks on it, and yeah. I had to like crack it open. That it hasn't really been like a lot of merch since like the eleventh Doctor, really. There hasn't really been, but I think because when Stephen, I think it was when Stephen Moffat left, they got really bad at kind of advertising. Like, yeah. like, I like I didn't really, I couldn't get in to Jodie Whittaker series. Um, I couldn't get into like the episodes or anything like like uh, it might have been Chris Chibnall's writing. I don't know, but yeah. I had no idea when anything was happening. Like when one series ended, when was it coming back? What was it doing? Like when was when was the return or any? Like I haven't heard anything about this centenary special. Is that her spring centenary? Yeah. Like I haven't heard anything about this special since that trailer came out with Ace and Tegan in it, and it's just like what's happening? Like Russell T Davis used to be so good. I don't know if he was in charge of it, but it was under his kind of era where like you wouldn't you wouldn't have not known. It was like everywhere. Yeah, like. If we don't, I'll be surprised if we don't get anything by next month. Yeah, because we know more about the 60th than we do about the <laughs> <any Saturday special. laughs> like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. Like, we'll get another announcement of maybe another person coming off to the 60th, won't we? Yeah, we'll know more about and, and Again, because Russell T. Davis is doing the 60th. And he he's like he's been like doing like all those announcements and stuff about like Neil Patrick Harris and everything being in it. Yeah. Whereas what's going on with the centenary? Maybe they want it to be a surprise. I don't know, but I don't feel like that wor has worked for them. That kind of strategy. Well, like we got um, I, I think the master we didn't realize the mar the master was kept secret. Um, Jack, like they've kept a lot of secret. Well, I I yeah. give I give Chimple that. I I would actually rather that. Um, in Doctor Who, um, yeah, I, I think it's, I think that's one of his best things he's done is keep certain things secret. Um, like, like I know David Tennant and Captain Tate was, oh, there was rumored for ages, so that it was going to be sooner or later that they were to get their announcement. And Shitty Gatwa, um, I don't know, they could have kept that Doctor announcement maybe a, longer. Um, yeah, I, 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 I did want that to be like a secret, like when. The regeneration happens, or maybe they've done that because maybe that David Tennant is going to be coming on and then shoot you a bit later. Maybe I've done it like that, but um, yeah. I do like to wait for things. But I get by now you'd have thought some sort of thing, maybe an announcement of what the episode's called, or um, maybe a trailer, or something. yeah, just something to kind of keep you Hooked. interested and yeah. excited so you know that it's coming. 
like when I was a kid, my dad was always like the one who was telling us everything because he was always on the Doctor Who forums. Whereas we were kids, we didn't really know anything about what was going on. And there's one thing I remember whenever there was the regeneration, like fake out when David Tennant's the 10th Doctor gets shot by a Dalek. And usually our dad kind of informs us. He used to tell us like, oh, like he told us when Christopher Eccleston was leaving, he was like, be prepared. He's, he's only staying one series, that kind of thing. And then... We, I remember my dad's face, like me and Alana, like that's my sister. We looked at him like so like betrayed. Like, why didn't you tell us David Tennant was leaving? And I remember him being like, because I didn't know. <laughs> so they must have kept that one, that under wraps really well. Because he was like totally baffled. And like my dad used to like be able to find out like anything yeah. that was coming up. Yeah, I didn't want David Tennant to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I oh, it was so hard because the thing about the David Tennant leaving as well is like I I love Matt Smith's era, I love him particularly with the poems, but um because of the handover of not only David Tennant but Stephen Moffat as well, there was a bigger shift than there was when Christopher Eccleston left because like the TARDIS changed, the intro changed, the music changed, the Doctor changed, the companion changed, so I think there was a lot more to kind of people had to kind of sort of cope, cope with all at once whenever Matt Smith came in. This is like, everything is so different. Yeah, like, I wasn't happy when that happened. Like, um, I, I was pretty sad when that regeneration happened, but um, I got into Matt Smith straight away. Like, I, even the first episode, I was well hooked into watching him and this kind of yeah. stuff. Um, but when he left... Um, I wasn't really into Peter Capaldi until his last series. Um, mm. His last series was good. Um, I wasn't really hooked to, as like you know when you're a doctor, like you're straight away maybe for the first, the, for maybe Chris, Chris and Matt and David, but Peter Capaldi took a bit of time. Um, and Jody, I Jody and Peter are in the same boat for me, you know, like like they're not, they're okay. Like not like entirely like hooked on them. Um, they're good doctors in their own way, but not entirely my, um, my, like my favorite doctors. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I always I always say the for me the beauty of the show is that everyone has their era and their opinions. Hmm. I wish people would be a lot like nicer when discussing differences in opinions because the fandom kind of has a. Yeah. <laughs> a bit of a problem with that but yeah. um i always thought that's one of the best things about the show because like there's like 13 doctors and everyone has like the era of the program they grew up with or the era of the program that they enjoyed the most or the doctors that they gel with the doctors that they don't and it's supposed to i feel like the differences in everyone's experience should be part of the beauty of it but then a lot of people kind of take it as like oh you don't like the doctor i like you are yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah, like I think everyone's doctor should be like who they feel most connected to. If like uh, the ninth doctor always have a place in my heart because he was my first doctor that I ever watched. Um, mm -hmm. so he's kind of to thank for. It. I think my most people really like it, like from the reboot because I think quite a lot of people probably did start watching it around that time. Yes. Um, like you should be kind of thankful that Peter, Christopher Eccleston like did that first series like it although things did go wrong with like the the people that were working with him and stuff but it's not those kind of things happen in like jobs and stuff it's not just acting it's all sorts of different things like people have to go on and, and stuff but that first series was great um like but the, the prime doctor who series like within new who for me um are probably one but kind of, it's hard, you know, up to probably David and and Matt series, like yeah. including Chris, those kind of the ones. And then the writing caused a bit poor at the start of Peter Capaldi's era, and then got very good towards the end. Yeah. Um, and for um, me, yeah. like series one will always be my favorite, but I think it's because it's so underappreciated because they, a lot of people don't really like think so much about like uh, the amount of pressure they were under because I remember there was a there was a time when I think it was David Tennant was doing a podcast it was either he was doing a podcast series or Billy Piper was doing a book oh yeah podcast. I remember David Tennant did one 
Yeah, and I remember Billy Piper saying like series one was like kind of like it was intense for them because they didn't know if this was going to work, if they were actually coming, like they were if bringing it back was going to work. And she said that it was a lot more relaxed for her filming series too because by that point they knew it was a hit, they knew it was all good and they knew that they had their audience whereas if, they, if Christopher Eccleston hadn't done as good a job as he did there wouldn't have been Diva Tennant for people to love and enjoy as much as they did and I think that a lot of people don't really like see that or recognize that or even give him and Billy Piper because it was very much her as well they don't get well Billy I said Billy Piper does get credit because people absolutely adore Rose like Rose is like <laughs> Rose is the one that most people um like and oh, yeah yeah uh, um whereas Chris's doctor people say oh I skipped him to go to David Tennant and you're like why <laughs> why not even just because his series is like the best thing I just don't understand why you would skip series one like watch it in order <laughs> like, like, yeah. Do it properly. yeah you don't get people who do that you know because like the you don't know what's happening why the doctor's bit is the way he is like the same doctor like David Tennant and you won't know who Jackie is you won't know who Rose is you probably won't know who Mickey is so all those people and Captain Jack who actually he comes on I think the third series yeah, yeah. He, he comes with the first series you're not gonna know who he is and he was in quite a lot of the first series probably half yeah. Pro- probably the majority of series one and you wouldn't get like the emotional impact of Pete in the parallel universe either because you didn't watch Father's Day if you skipped right. series one. Like, it yeah. was like Father's Day was like, um, for, a, for a one part episode, too, it packed a lot in. Although, I, I always feel like it the only problem was is that when Rose created the paradox, the Reapers showed up to like clean everything up, whereas that never happens again whenever there's a paradox. And it was just kind of like, <laughs> it's a bit kind of just I suppose some things come and go but like it didn't really make sense especially because Matt Smith's era was definitely oh time can be rewritten you can do (laughs) whatever you want kind of thing and like there wasn't a lot of consequence but you wouldn't you wouldn't get the emotional impact of that of that of whenever they go to the parallel universe if you skip series one yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting you know to see what the future has in store, I guess. Yeah, like I'm, I'm very looking forward to Russell T. Davis coming back because his era was my childhood growing up, kind of, whenever Matt Smith came in. That year I went to high school, so it wasn't so much that I was growing up with it as much anymore, still kind of developing, kind of, you know, teenager and stuff, but, like, as a kid, Russell T. Davis' era was kind of like, you know, the childlike awe watching it weekly kind of thing, looking up to the doctor as a wee kid, being like, oh, that's so amusing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting, though, like, because you got him right in the 60th, which I'm glad he is right in the 60th, because, um, but I just hope the last episode, there's an hour and a half long um, for Joe's last episode, I just hope it's, it's, it's going to be good, um, because I wasn't that impressed with the last one. Yeah, um, and like the flux series was okay, um, and like the when series twelve was okay, series eleven was yeah, it wasn't the best, um, but but yeah, it's gonna be interesting and to see Shooty Gatwell's Doctor, it's gonna be interesting yeah. to see him because I think he's gonna be great. Yeah, I'm glad people kind of reacted well to his casting because I feel like it was gonna be like a double-edged sword no matter who they hired because mm. because not casting another woman there would be people being like oh well look it failed didn't it they're hiring a man again kind of thing <laughs> like well yeah. they so just knew that was gonna happen didn't you? <laughs> yeah and then if they didn't do that there would be people being like oh well it's still going in the same direction it was always going in kind of thing and I don't think there would have been like I was worried about whoever they were going to announce because it was never going to be like... I suppose not everyone can be satisfied anyway, but I'm glad that the reaction has been positive for Shitty's sake more than anyone else, you know? 
Yeah, because he, he loves the show himself, so he, he's watched it all and like, he's grown up with it himself. Um, yeah. And I think it's about the same age that Matt Smith was when, when he was a doctor. Um, yeah. So, like, he's done a year older, I think, um, she is, than when Matt was. Uh, but it's, it's going to be... It's gonna, I'm 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 interested because I want I I'm looking forward to seeing who the new composer is as well because like the music hasn't been that the, the standard it hasn't been bad hasn't been good under Jody but the music hasn't been at the standard that Murray Gold was like yeah. I I say even bring Murray Gold back or, or a completely new composer um yeah. that, uh, whoever it is I trust in Russell because he knows like the show he knows like what be good because. The music is like it links into autism as well because it links in because I'm always I always have the the Murray Gold soundtrack on well uh, all the time so yeah. um that that's one thing I'm looking forward to seeing who that is yeah Murray Gold was always going to be like massive shoes to fill anyway because like even for like the smallest like incident incidental music like he had it like just he would blast out like the the like the most amazing like music even for like the smallest of moments and like you could like sit and just listen to his like music just even in your bedroom you know like <laughs> I always um listen to hologram it's the music that played whenever Christopher Arkelson regenerates and like even like god how many years would it be now like over a decade later like it still yeah. brings you back to like yeah. watching that scene and being like no don't go kind of thing Whereas whenever he left, it just wasn't the same. Yeah, and and and, and people still asking him, "Are you are you going to come back? Are you coming back for the city here? Are you going to come back?" Um, but yeah, like you understand why doctors don't always do that, but it's for certain reasons. And um, I think I think his doctor would have quite a lot of arguments with others. You know, like how yeah. his doctor is, like him and Peter be arguing all day long. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um. Like, which is why I think he he said that he would probably do something on his maybe his own maybe with Billy Piper, but at the same time he probably wouldn't because like he Russell and his team. I don't know if he's got the same team, but he has he has a couple of fallouts. So it's he's done stuff a big finish, but I'm not sure if it was seeing him on the screen. Like yeah. for Doctor Who, um, which is a shame, but it's, it's still, it's like, like people have their own choices. Like David Tennant, like it doesn't have to come back. He don't want to. Like you know, they don't, all they do is get off. I think every Doctor probably would for the six yeah. year. Um, it's just David Tennant and Kevin Tate are at like that at the at the heat of the six year. I reckon at the start. Yeah, I'd love to see more classic era elements just personally because like for me the 50th it was more Matt Smith and David Tennant kind of meeting each other and that was a big deal that was exciting and there was the Tom Baker cameo at the end but it was kind of just like is this really a celebration of 50 years like we didn't have like a lot like there was the Zygons which was okay yeah that's a classic reference but it didn't feel like to me, anyway, it felt like a celebration more of the new parts of the show than the classic era parts, which kind of was disappointing a little bit because, like, it's supposed to be a 50 year celebration. And I know a lot of the doctors don't look the way they did on the program, but I feel like they're, they could write something that would excuse that, you know? Like D Peter Davison, the fifth doctor, actually wrote a little side piece called the Five Ish Doctors Reboot. I don't know if you watched it, but it was for the 50th. And it was basically about him, Sylvester McCoy, and Colin Baker trying to get into the 50th anniversary special. Like they were like, like Peter Davison was trying to get his daughter Georgia to like contact David and say, like, can you not get us in or something like that? And I actually enjoyed that a lot more because there was like because like David Tennant was in it and Matt Smith was in it and then the older doctors were in it as well and I just I'm worried that they're going in that same direction for the 60th I'm hoping they're maybe hiding some like classic elements but yeah. I mean David Tennant did say I don't know if it was recently or what but he said that like we think we've we, we see what they're doing but there's actually a lot more 
going on and being filmed so i have hope still <laughs> for something yeah. yeah like like all that we've seen is just what they want us to see yeah um, like they're not going to show us stuff that of a top secret like yeah. you, you don't know like you could have all three masters back you don't know yeah um, oh god, they, that'd be really intense. That'd be good. That'd be a good idea. <laughs> like you got Missy. Well, they done John Sim and Michelle Gomez and yeah, one, one story. But and then you got Sasha and um. But I'm very curious. You know, like depending, this is more like I I do think we'll have more than three specials. Like we got the three special with David and Kevin Tate. But I've got high hopes that it just won't be about them. Like yeah. the, um. Sure, there's got to be other elements around the 60th. Um, like since their casting, um, I've always been dubious, you know. Like, is if is it a race if David Tennant is re is like Jody regenerates into David Tennant? Is it that David Tennant is trying to find out what, why he's got this face again? Um, who he is, um, and maybe going back and so and helping things, maybe. Um, and certain stuff, and maybe it's just a, a race, maybe to find shoot get with doctor. Yeah. Um, um what will be good, you know, is when when JD regenerates, you see shooty, like you you see shooty, and then it just but the regeneration goes wrong. Then David Tennant head pops out. It'd be nice if they did it like that. Yeah, like you kind of like you get a, you get a glimpse of them, and then something happens, and it's David Tennant, and it's just like oh we. Well, what yeah. this is not supposed to happen because it makes more sense, you know. Because going straight into the 60th for shooty, um, it's a big deal because like the, the 60th is a big deal, um, yeah. And, and like when it was the 50th, Matt Smith was near the end of his time as the doctor, and that made sense. Um, so it would make sense for Davidson to come back one to get the viewers back, people will watch it. Um, yeah. not, not that no one will watch it with shooty, it's just that. Maybe start with David Tennant, and then along the line, uh, I'm sure they've got scenes together, David Tennant and Shooty, um, at some point. But like, there's lots of spe speculation that people want Matt Smith back in the ponds, um, and yeah, like he's sure dirt. But I think they're just leaving announcements for now because they've done a lot of announcements, haven't they? Um, yeah. And they're probably going to wait, um, because no announcement has been made <laughs> for the for the special in October for Jody, so maybe they're waiting, maybe Russell's yeah. waiting for that, or we'll wait for that, and maybe more will come next year. Yeah, there's a part of me that kind of gets annoyed at the people who are, like, taking photos, like, on the sets and stuff, like, they had photos of, like, Kath Catherine Tate, like, fishing Bernard Cribbins in a wheelchair and everything like that, and they were always like, oh my god, Donna and Will for coming back, and I was just like, will you stop? These are kind of, like, spoiling it. Like, they 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 obviously don't want people taking photos. Uh, like like you say, we are just seeing what they're letting us see. But it's one of those things where I know people are excited. And I know people kind of want to share what they're seeing, kind of thing. But it's kind of just like give it a rest. Yeah, just a little bit. It's, it's kind of unavoidable. Um, yeah, it's like I've shared a few things like about it, like um a few clips. So I've I've been down I, I've been down to Bristol myself and had a few photos of, of where they were um, doing it when no one was there. I didn't want to go there when it was action packed because I didn't want to see any of that. Um, but I was, I was on the spots where Patrick uh, Harris was, was doing his little dance. Um, but <laughs> but the thing is, like people like will comment on your video and saying stop the spoilers, but it's it's unavoidable. You've probably like before anyone you've probably seen it anyway. Like like people are gonna talk about it nonstop. Um, yeah. Um and it comes to the point is like I don't think Doctor Who will do enough for you to spoil the episode. That like we know Neil Patrick Harris is on the set anyway. We know yeah. all all those people that we've seen. Um, barring Bernard Cribbins that hasn't actually been announced that he's in it, or the Noble Family, but yeah. we but we know they are because we've seen pictures. Um, yeah, so and we know Yasmin yeah, Finney is. I think it's been confirmed that she's Donna's daughter because I think it was she was called Rose Noble. Yeah, she is. They they announced it as Rose, but they didn't say anything else. They just said her character's gonna be called Rose. Um, yeah, which makes sense to be do Donna's daughter and call her Rose because Rose and the Doctor. Um, yeah. 
people lost their minds, oh my god, when they thought that she was actually Rose Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it might be from a different universe. Who knows? It could be, I suppose. We don't we don't really know. The one thing I will say about like the set pictures and stuff like that, it does kind of open up for kind of like discussion about what's gonna happen. Like, is Neil Patrick Harris the celestial toy maker or is he someone else? Yeah. Or some or is there something else that we don't know? I think it would be cool if he was a so celestial toy maker. That would be kind of like the classic era kind of imprint that I'm that I kind of would like to see. Yeah, it it it, it, uh, it would be interesting because, like that, that's like the first Doctor, wasn't it? Like the the, the, the toy maker. So it it will be good because for the sixth year, bringing things back that started right at the beginning. Yeah, and it's a kind of like they're able to like bring an element in because, like for example, William Harnell is and he's he passed away long ago. It would be able to bring like an imprint from his era in without like having without having to worry about like. Yeah, they they could bring David Bradley in, but no, yeah. like, he's done first doctor. Yeah, and, and he actually he actually looked quite well. I don't I don't I didn't really watch Twice Upon a Christmas. Is that what it's called? Oh, I think Upon a Time. A Twice Upon a Time, uh, because I had kind of fallen off kind of watching it as regularly anymore. But I know he looked well as William Hartnell, and I know he does. Does he do the audio? I think he does do the audio. But I think he does. Well, yeah. Yeah, I think he has, and like, yeah, like, but I, what I think is, you you either I uh, bring lots of the old. I, I think a lot. Of, I think there'll be older, maybe doctors making cameo appearances, possibly in Jodie's last episode. Um, yeah. it'll be it'll be nice. Um, because it's like the celebration of the BBC. Um, but they just got to be careful that everyone gets a fair chance of screen time. Um, in the episode, which is why I guess I've done an hour and a half. And because I guess there's gonna be more people coming in it. I would love to see K9 in it. Um, yeah. um it'd be nice to have him back. Of course Sarah Jane can't be there, but you have companions that were with Sarah Jane that possibly have got the dog that they kept the yeah. K9. Or, 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 Maybe Ronnie will, because Ronnie's is it an audio story series Ronnie's getting like ra- the character Ronnie, she Maybe. Is... You've got Joe Grant there maybe K-9. as well. Yeah. She might have K9 now, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, like you might maybe Joe Grant because maybe she's older, and but yeah, like I think more people will be in it because they wouldn't have shown all those people in the trailer if there's not going to be more yeah. added in. There'll probably be a lot of surprises, I reckon. Um, who knows? Um, wouldn't wouldn't mind seeing the regeneration out the TARDIS for once. Um, yeah. Um, because I don't know. It, it's almost like a an autism thing again like because p- people go into the TARDIS to regenerate maybe that's where they're comfortable to do it oh. <laughs> and he's dead he's like safe from like it's safe. it's like the their comfort area they're safe there they know like they're that, that's where they know where everything is just as they like it yeah like yeah it, it, it's pretty it's pretty crazy but you know from the scorpion that like, turn left the scorpion on the back um, episode when I was younger, I, 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 I always used to be like, Is there anything on my back? I was, I was always looking around because, of course, Donna can't see it or yeah. like really. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking around, is there one on my back too? <laughs> yeah, just like reaching, I'd be reaching around having like a yeah, I would always thing. do that, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'll do the same, like with the water episode, water was on Mars, like fearful of like <laughs> the, the water and stuff like that. And the same with the girl in the fireplace episode, like. At night time, and just seeing anything under your bed. <laughs> yeah, like we get it, like it made it, uh, like a generation of children, like they made them counting shadows, staring at statues without blinking, checking fireplaces, afraid of gas masks, zombies, weary of water. I remember going to get a drink of water after watching the waters of Mars and just kind of like staring at it for a minute. Like, should I? <laughs> like, is it? Is it okay? Um. And that was actually one of the scary things because you had to drink it because you have to have, you have to drink water. Just, you have to, same as you have to blink. Yeah, yeah. I Once I went to, the, there's a London exhibit, uh, like, Doctor Who like experience um, in London. Um, and I, there, there was, it was when Matt Smith was a doctor and there was this Weeping Angels bit and I didn't blink the whole time the time when I went through. Um, and I tell my parents, don't blink too, and I, I don't know if they did or not, but um, probably. 
probably don't listen to me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll blink. It, it weren't the, like ones you can see, but you know when they're like new, like the Weeping Angels, like broken, like stone where you can't really see the face. Uh, yeah. It was, it was kind of them ones, and I wouldn't blink. Um, and another one that got me, I didn't like the silence, and I didn't like the dolls. And when Matt Smith, yeah. they scared me too. <laughs> yeah, they were, they, they were. <laughs> yeah. Uh, porcelain dolls in general, like even not even like ones that look like as ragged as those ones in that episode, like even just normal porcelain dolls, I have a problem with. They just, there's just something kind of uncanny about them. I just don't like them. Um. Yeah. But they, they did that thing at the end of Blink that was totally unnecessary where they were doing like the showing just a variety of statues. Like not even like we like not even like the weeping angels, just a variety of statues and they were saying, Don't blink. And like it was just like you didn't have to do that. <laughs> you didn't have to do that to me. Like I thought it was just these angels and now you're implying that it's any statue. <laughs> like I didn't need that. Yeah. yeah. And even David Tennant went in the episode completely. He had a massive impact for the even the little fit monologue he did on the tape. Yeah, and like that was the first time he said "wibbly wobbly, tiny wimey" as well. Yeah, and I yeah. thought Matt Smith said that as well. Oh yeah, Matt Smith said it. Like it became like a kind of like I don't know if David Tennant said it again, but I know Matt Smith said it a couple of times. Yeah, but Blink was the first time that epi- that wording "wibbly wobbly, tiny wimey." I think that was the yeah. first time it was said. Yes. And that, as you say, it made an impact because it was used, and that's what people say all the time now. Definitely, and I think these next two, like you got Joe's episode, and then you've got the sixtieth. I think that for a while, it put probably the last chance to get as many people you want to come back into Doctor Two from like years ago, and then yeah. when we get into shooting series, um, focus on the future. I think would be good. Like focus on new companions that will be memorable for the next maybe twenty odd years. Um, yeah. Like, because, like, it's not that we don't want to see the old ones. Of course, we want to see Martha. Of course, we want to see Rose. Of course, we want to see all these. But we want new ones to remember because we're always used to the ones when we were watching it when we were growing up. Because yeah. It'd be nice for new people who are growing up now, like watching Thirteen or, or like it's gonna be that that will be remembered as their first Doctor, and then so on. You're always gonna remember how old we get. You're always gonna remember that first Doctor you watched, and it's yeah. been. It's, I I know. I just want companions to remember in the future just new ones you know yeah i'd love like non-human companions i don't yeah. think that's been explored enough yeah, because right. like in the classic era there was a few aliens he, tra- he traveled with romana a time lady for a while you know like i don't think it's been explored enough the idea of it doesn't have to be humans it can be like humanoid looking aliens yeah. but they could be from anywhere they could be from any time as well, because he's taken people from like the I think no, I was about to say the Victorian era, but her name is Victoria. I don't think she might have, but she was from um she was from the past and like Yeah. I think the past, future, alien, you know, it doesn't have to be like twenty first century London, because it's it's usually London. Yeah, you know, have a companion that's not in like the twenty first century, like maybe a past or a future companion. Like, yeah. But like, like you had that with Captain Jack, but do it with another person. And but when she comes along, maybe focus not don't have a companion straight away. Just focus on yeah. on, on just seeing who you are. Like, it, like they go into that quite fast, don't they? I know it's all about the companions and the Doctor and that, but they go into the companions right off on the off, like like. Yeah. From with Rose, that, that that was a good episode because they they kind of done it the other way around that time. Like we're just concentrating on the companion, then we meet the Doctor, and then but it'd be nice to do that, do that in reverse yeah. for maybe Shooty's uh, era. Yeah. Um. To and, be, it's yeah. A, I suppose each kind of like well David Tennant's era anyway. Like each new companion was kind of introduced that way because we follow Martha. In Smith and Jones, and then we also follow. Well, I'd say we follow Donna in. We actually first meet her in Runaway Bride, but we 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 kind of follow from her perspective in what's called Partners in Crime, yeah. which was really frustrating. By the way, I know the near misses were supposed to be frustrating, but like as a kid, like I was ready to like, yeah, explode, just like, <laughs> why do they keep missing each other? You know, like 
I'm quite a sensory like with autism, and, and and you know that sound that they made with the screwdrivers, like they're really loud, oh, yeah. like because I I get really I I say creeped out about certain noises. So if if people are eating next to me, I can't. I, they can't make so much noise and I don't understand it really because I, I, to me I'm not making a lot of noise um, and then other people do and then I was like how's that work <laughs> yeah I can be quite funny with noises for me it's more like really loud noises like if a massive truck passes me in the street or from beside like roadworks it like really gets under my skin so I have like my dad bought me like ear defenders because I just it doesn't necessarily like mute the noise completely but it kind of brings it just down a bit <laughs> like brings it like <laughs> to a more acceptable level yeah yeah like uh yeah i i i get that because like it's just noise is annoying i guess yeah uh, yeah like um, i never liked fireworks or balloons because they were like unpredictable you didn't know when it would like if it was gonna come or not yeah. I hated them when I was little. I'm still kind of weary around balloons. Yeah. Yeah. Like the popping noise and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess you don't you, you don't blow, blow balloons up yourself then, like if you did it for a party. Oh, God, no. I don't even think I, I'd be able to. Like, I feel yeah. like my nephew has asked a couple of times and I'm just like, no, I don't like balloons. But, like, I don't think I have, like, the... <laughs> The, the horsepower behind my like blows to even get a balloon up anyway. Do you do you like clowns? I was never, I was never. I think I've never really been in a position where I've been around clowns that much. There's like okay. a place like nearby called Coco's where like people would have their parties sometimes, and you can choose to have Coco the clown there. And I wasn't a fan <laughs> of him. Yeah, I, I wasn't a fan of him. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, that's really the only clown that I've had to be around. But I don't, I don't like, <laughs> I don't like the idea of them really. No, but like, you, you wouldn't watch a film called It then. Like you got it, like the clown and and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I I know of it. I can't say yeah. I've seen it, but I know of it, and I know yeah. I know the premise of it and everything. Yeah, it can be it's a couple of jump scares in there, but but yeah, like I think you've had clowns in Dot Two, I reckon. Yes, Sergeant episode, Sergeant Adventures. It had clowns. Yeah. In them. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um. It, it's. It's. Yeah. We all have these certain things that we we don't like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, like just just thinking there, I thought of the clown. It was in the God Complex, and then it's oh, one of those yeah. things, like, what's going to be in my room kind but, of thing. You start wondering what yeah. will be in my room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like. Uh, like you have the the minotaur. I, I did like that. Um, did did you like when like they had the break in, like they they stopped halfway through and then they went out and went again a year later with um. It might have been not a year later, but they had they had a little break with with him. Yeah, series. I don't think that was a good idea. Like I don't personally, it didn't really work for me because I feel like it got people like hyped up and then it kind of deflated a bit because like f the first time they did it I think was season six with River's reveal of who she was and in the moment you're like oh my god and then like you kind of like as the months pass it's just kind of like you've accepted it by that point and you're not as like and also like when it says like we will return with let's kill Hitler you're just kind of like wait a minute <laughs> like what's that got to do with River <laughs> I remember being so confused because she's just like I'm your daughter and then yeah, I, I didn't understand dramatic. it. Yeah, that, that yeah. was really confusing. I don't think I don't think it worked well in terms of like viewership and getting people to come back because I feel like people would have came back immediately the following week. Yeah, yeah, I I guess that you get maybe they've done that so you get more episodes or in a year, maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe and that's why they've done it. Kind of worked better, kind of when Amy and Rory left. Because then it gave time, and then Clara came in. Yeah, it felt like a fresh series kind of thing. Yeah, it did. Like I, I, like I think the good thing is that like Russell T Davis will will, will make these new like side shows like it related to Doctor Who, and it, like yeah, that that you can have like like you have your series of Doctor Who now, like with a year, and then you'll have maybe like, a side show or two. Uh, having a, their own series, so you're not like you're missing out on 
any Doctor Who. Yeah. Movie. Um, and I think I've heard it rumored that he might bring back the Christmas specials. Yeah, like yeah. the Doctor Who Christmas special, it used to be like the staple of a Christmas, like you know, presents in the morning, you have your dinner, and then there's still the Doctor Who Christmas special to watch in the evening. Yeah, yeah, I, I prefer them. I've not really been liking the uh, New Year Day ones. Yeah, um, it's kind of depressing on New Year's Day, you know, because <laughs> you're like, oh, we got it's no, it's no year. Uh, yeah. yeah, the only good thing about today is we got Doctor Who one. Um, yeah, if it's good, if it's good. <laughs> Gotta be good. Yeah, like they decided like, to be like, oh yeah, let's start off the new decade of twenty ten by saying goodbye to David Tennant, like because that was. Oh the yeah, they've done that. Yeah. And I was just kind of like, well, this is not how I wanted to start my new decade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, then we had um Matt Smith. But yeah. later on, um, which I I I I do like it when they do those two parters. You know, like like when when they do two parters, it's quite nice. Um. Matt Smith had a few. I think each Doctor has had a two-parter at least. Um, yeah, that was something else Stephen Moffat started to do away with. Was it Stephen Moffat? It was. Was it yeah. Series Seven? He started. He stopped kind of doing as many. Yeah, I'm sure in most each Doctor's had like a two-parter. Like the yeah. doc, I think Pick um Pick Capaldi had one. Had a couple. Matt Smith, David Tennant, Eccleston had one. Um. He did. Uh, like if you count the um part, his last two, and you had the empty child episodes with the masks, so, and the and the Slovene. Yeah, and the Slovene. So it's kind of a few in his own series. Yeah, the pattern I always noticed. It seemed to be in Russell T Davis's era anyway. It was like you got two double parters a series, and then the finale, whether the finale was a two parter finale or a three parter finale. Yeah. And then it changed a bit when Matt Smith came in, I think. Yeah, because in series six there was the two double parters and then the finale was a one parter. Yeah. Or just the one part, I mean. <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure all of David Tennant's series had like episodes that went on from each other. Like yeah. at the end. Like each series he'd done. Yeah, there was always like like a kind of thread through yeah. it all, connecting yeah. it all up. Yeah, I think I think that was that was really interesting, you know. Yeah, I think the double parters or three parters were better for the finale because it gave more space and room to kind of develop things and kind of make it as big. Whereas I felt series six's finale was very rushed because it was trying to cram everything into the what well, it was like forty forty five minutes that they that they had. Yeah, uh, yeah, I I. Yeah, it was. It did seem quite rough, didn't it? Yeah, like because it it probably would have been a lot better because like the idea of like River Defy and like this fixed point of being like, no, I'm not gonna kill him, and then the ramifications that that would have. There probably would have been more time to expand upon that if they had given it like at least a two parter. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully we get more two parters because they are they they do really well. Yeah, like the some of the cliffhangers are like. Amazing, like they guaranteed you yeah, coming next week. Yeah, and they made, they made sure you were coming back. Yeah, and the 60th, I'm sure, or even Jelly's episode could be a cliffhanger. Who knows? Yeah, um, and the 60th, I'm sure, will be, um, always a cliffhanger. <laughs> oh, god, it, 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 it's effective, it works. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best way to get people back coming back, definitely. And before we go, Erin, because it's been great talking to you about Doctor and Autism, we've had a we've had a good chat. Yeah, uh, we've yeah. Um, what 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 quote do you have that relates to Doctor uh, like for yourself? I personally like I have it on a badge and everything. It's Matt Smith's quote: "We're all stories in the end. Just make it a good one." Because well, it apply it applies to anything. Like everything you do, once you're gone, it's all gonna be like a story to someone else. They'll tell other people about you. Like our grandparents, with are all everything they've done. It's all stories to us. And like, best thing to do is just make sure your story's a good one. And as an author, that also, I try to make my stories good. No, no, don't know if they are, but <laughs> yeah, if yeah, we are all stories in the end. So we gotta make it a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. it's the best thing you can do. Yeah, so it's a good thing that you use things from Doctor Who though and you're writing though, Erin. It's, it's, it's good to see. So you might be writing Doctor Who in a, maybe in a few years, maybe. Oh my God. <laughs> that would actually be really cool, but like, I don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah. Bring um, destroy the we, we if you do write it, make sure there's a decision if Gallifrey is here or gone because it's always there, and it? it's always there or it's gone. We decide yeah. if it's gone or or it's not coming back. <laughs> yeah, make it final. <laughs> yeah, we gotta make it final because like each series, it's either it's destroyed or or it's back. Yeah, or it's in a nebulous limbo that he has to go and find it, and you're like, I don't even know what's happening anymore with yeah. it. Yeah, who knows? Like, there might be a storyline where they say the Doctor wasn't from it, that. It's not his home planet; it was somewhere else. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, imagine that. Imagine that. But yeah, by that point, they're just. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but I hope you've had a good time, Aaron. It's been it's been, it's been great talking to you. Yeah, it's been fantastic. I'll take any excuse to talk about Doctor Who. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it, it's been good because, like, relating to autism and, like, you talked a little bit about your diagnosis as well, so uh, it, it's pretty cool. And I, I guess it's good, a good way we found each other because we wouldn't have uh, talked about Doctor Who otherwise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, exactly. Definitely. Well, thanks, Erin, and I hope you, well, not I hope, I know you've had a good time, so that, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you I have. Yeah, well, thanks, Erin. Thank you.